Good evening. I want to welcome all of you, especially my fellow alums from Milano. I know there are a few of you here and some from even a long time ago. And some of the old timers may remember when Henry Cohn was here. As all of you know, Henry was a visionary man and it was as a result of many years of experience that he had working in the city and all around the world that he had the vision of starting a school at the new school to teach students to be better equipped as urban professionals. Back then, the only degree available was urban planning. And then in 1971, the first class entered Henry's school, which was elegantly called by the acronym DUAPA, now Milano, but in those days it was DUAPA, the Department of Urban Affairs and Policy Analysts, Policy Analysis, excuse me, for the analysts. The school has grown dramatically since then as a result of the thoughtful analysis and ongoing efforts of the deans and faculty over the years. Henry would have been delighted to see where his vision has led and how crucial Milana's students have become in the development and implementation of policy management and values in cities and the rapidly globalizing world. Don't think for a minute that the leaders of Milana today are not tapping into this new worldwide market. They sure are. And there are great plans for the future of tapping even further. On a personal level, I kept up with Henry over the years and he continued to be a professor, a mentor, and a good friend of mine for many years after I graduated until he passed away. Those of us who knew him in the early years may recall that Henry was not the most charismatic public speaker, but one-on-one -on -one he sparkled. I remember many a lighthearted evening of dinner with him and his charming and dearly beloved wife, Evelyn, who was an aspiring actress. Even though Evelyn's light name never appeared in neon lights, she was the star in his life and outshined all the significant accomplishments. I'm so sorry. The significant accomplishments that he made, she was still high above that as the light of his life. Today, the Henry Cohn Chair is held by Peter Isinger, a distinguished scholar in the field of urban studies and especially urban poverty, a subject that meant so much to Henry. I feel very lucky to have been able to support a chair in Henry's honor and to keep his name alive for New York City and the generations of students who continue to benefit from his vision. He would have been very pleased to see that the Milano School has become a place for top quality students to become leaders in the areas of urban affairs, policy analysis, and much more. He would have been pleased to have such a distinguished occupant of the Henry Cohn professorship, and he would have been pleased that such an eminent economist as Jeffrey Sachs is visiting Milano tonight as the fourth Henry Cohn lecturer. Now I would like to introduce one of Henry Cohn's successors, the current dean, Lisa Servan, who has continued to make great strides for the school since she assumed the deanship a little over a year ago. Please welcome Dean Lisa Servan to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, thanks for the generous introduction. As Susan mentioned, my name is Lisa Servan, and I am the Dean of Milano, the New School for Management and Urban Policy, and also the New School for General Studies. I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us for tonight's program. As Susan mentioned, the fourth 
in the Henry Cohen Lecture Series, which, as Susan just told us about so eloquently, memorializes the founding dean of Milano. We have a number of other Milano alumni and faculty and former faculty here in the audience tonight, and I'm wondering if we can have a show of hands. How many of you either taught with, worked with, or studied with Henry Cohen when he was here? All right, we've got a few of you, so we should have a little memory sharing session later. As Susan also mentioned, the Henry Cohen prof professorship and lecture both focus on urban economic issues and the impact of these issues on women, families, and children. Improving the lives of urban residents, families, and communities is at the core of Milano's mission. The School Center for New York City Affairs is a leader in providing crucial information about the ground level impact of our city's child welfare policies to the public and policymakers alike. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Susan for playing such a central role in enabling the Center for New York City Affairs, Milano, and the New School to achieve those goals and so much else. Among her many philanthropic contributions, Susan endowed the Henry Cohen Professorship in 1998 through a grant from the Uris Brothers Foundation. The Uris Brothers, Harold and Percy, were Susan's father and uncle, uh, respectively. And if you want to learn more about them, I invite you to the seventh floor of the Milano building at 72 Fifth Avenue, where we have a Uris library. And there's a beautiful plaque that tells part of their story, and a fabulous photograph also. Several other supporters of Milano are also here with us in the audience tonight, and I want to acknowledge them as well. Jeff Hodgman, a member of our board of governors, is here, as is Emily Youssef, who is also a board member and the chair of Milano's Dean's Alumni Council. Karen Adler and Alyssa Drayton, both members of the Dean's Alumni Council, are also here. And I also want to acknowledge Sarah Rosen of J.P. Morgan Private Bank, which plays a very important role at the Center for New York City Affairs. And finally, Jeffrey Scheuer, also a supporter. Please join me in acknowledging all of Milano's board members and supporters. Now, before I introduce our next speaker, I have one housekeeping item. I hope that each of you has been given an index card. Yes? Nod your heads. No, you will be given an index card <laughs> on which to write um, questions that we'll collect. You can feel free to write your questions down as um, Dr. Sachs is speaking. We'll collect them and use them during the question and answer period. Our next speaker is my friend and colleague, Tatiana Waugh. Many people here know Tatiana as a faculty member of both Milano and Eugene Lang College, the new school for liberal arts. I first met Tatiana when she was a doctoral student at Rutgers University, and I was on the faculty. Her work focuses on community economic development in developing nations and in minority communities here in the US. Her biography, which is much more extensive than I'll be able to share with you tonight, is in your program. This academic year, however, Tatiana is on sabbatical from the New School and serving as an advisor to the Haitian Policy Program at Columbia University's Earth Institute, whose director, Jeffrey Sachs, is tonight's lecturer. In that capacity, Tatiana has been spending most of her time in Haiti. She returns back there on Monday, she just told me. She's doing remarkable work there with the government to advance the development strategy of one of the poorest countries, a country that's also facing absolutely devastating environmental challenges and dire circumstances overall. So it's an honor to have her with us tonight to introduce this year's Henry Cohen lecturer. Please welcome Tatiana Wa to the podium. Thank you, Dean Servan. It's so good to be back home at the new school. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm delighted and deeply honored to be introducing Professor Jeffrey Sachs this evening. His remarkable body of work is a model for what we strive to achieve at Milano to bring about societal change and improve life on our planet, a rare phenomenon. Professor Sachs is widely considered to be the leading international economic advisor of his generation and the leading expert on sustainable development. For more than 20 years, he has been on the forefront of the challenges of economic development, poverty alleviation, and enlightened globalization, promoting policies to help all parts of the world benefit from economic opportunities and well-being. He is the Quetelet Professor of Sustainable Development and Professor of Economics and of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University and Director of the Earth Institute at Columbia. 
Prior to joining Columbia, he spent more than 20 years at Harvard University, where he was also director of the Center of International Development. Today, as director of the Earth Institute, he leads large-scale efforts to promote the mitigation of human-induced climate change. Among its various programs and projects, the Institute is working on an environmental restoration design for the Republic of Haiti, an island nation close to my heart and the subject of much of my work and research interest. From 2002 and to 2006, Professor Sachs was the director of the UN Millennium Project and special advisor to UN Secretary General Kofi Annan on the Millennium Development Goals. This is an unprecedented and internationally sanctioned set of concrete goals to reduce extreme poverty, disease, and hunger by year 2015. Today, he continues to serve as special advisor to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and serves as president and co-founder of Millennium Promise Alliance, a nonprofit organization aimed at ending extreme global poverty. A trained economist, he is also known for his work as an economic advisor to governments in Latin America and the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, and Asia. Of course, his expertise and insight is often called upon at home, and we appreciate his presence tonight, fresh off the shuttle from Washington, D.C., where he participated in today's White House Job Summit. He is the author of hundreds of scholarly articles and many books, including the two New York Times bestseller, Commonwealth and the End of Poverty, and was twice named by Time Magazine among the 100 most influential leaders in the world. I've had the privilege of working with Professor Sachs for the past six months. As um, our dean just mentioned, I spent most of my time in Haiti. I am convinced that his extraordinary contributions are fueled by, one, a passionate commitment to his craft and abiding faith that the problems we face as a global village are not beyond our capacity to solve them. By an enduring hope that we will indeed come together to overcome these challenges, and by a genuine love for all humanity, it is with great honor, respect, and gratitude that I present to you Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tatiana, thank you for such a lovely, wonderful introduction and for all the fantastic work you're doing. Haiti's not an easy place, and it has been in crisis for all of its history, unfortunately. And Tatiana is remarkable and valiant in, uh, and with great confidence of the Haitian leadership helping to sort through another uh, very, very difficult period that Haiti is facing. And it's really my honor and pleasure to be working together with you because I'm watching your amazing capacity to help interpret and find, find ways forward. And Lisa, uh, Dean Lisa Servan, thank you very much for having me here. It's really a great pleasure. Uh, it's actually the first time I've been at the New School, uh, and uh, I'm thrilled, I have to say. This is such a fabulous institution and uh, filled with uh, such wondrous history and uh, such uh, great talent that for me it's, uh, it's extraordinarily exciting, and I hope we do a lot of it uh, now that I'm a New Yorker uh, and, uh, and, and close by. And it's a great joy to be giving the fourth lecture in the Henry Cohen Lecture Series. I really am happy to be here because it meant all the flights worked exactly right uh, with two minutes to spare. And uh, to show you that I do have my priorities right, I waved goodbye to the president and uh, uh, skipped out in the afternoon because I was very confident they were going to solve all the problems of unemployment on their own uh, and that we would solve all the rest of the problems this evening uh, in, in the time together. I've chosen for my remarks tonight a, a, a big title and mainly a lot of puzzlement, so I want to think aloud with you. This is a school of social research, and I want to try to understand a, a, a big problem. So the title I gave myself was 
markets, state, and democracy, colon, lessons from the economic crisis. I'm puzzled, like you are, at why our country is in such a profound crisis right now. Uh, what is driving a, what I will call a crisis of economic governance, but clearly it's a crisis that goes beyond economic governance to many other aspects of governance. I don't know if you feel the same way I do, but this is the worst that I've seen in certainly uh, my adult lifetime, and I think in many ways it's uh, the worst that we've had in a political crisis, certainly for, for decades and arguably, uh, as is commonly said these days, since, uh, since the Great Depression. And I find it very puzzling because in many ways our political system is behaving, I think, worse than it has for decades. Our inability to find solutions seems to be greater. The breakdowns of particular systems in our country, even some pretty basic things like emergency response after a disaster or perhaps more subtle uh, issues that I'll turn to, um, are not working well. The level of incivility in the country is high and rising. And if we step back, and I think I was very much primed by the fact that I'm at the New School tonight to think about this, not in the immediate problem solving, though I'll say a few words about that because that's usually how I think. What's the checklist of six things to do? But why is it that we are in a situation that seems so peculiar, uh, so unlike uh, the country that uh, we expect it to be, not in every regard, because this country's had a lot of flaws for a long time, but they seem to be more dramatic now. I want to try to understand a bit about this from a both pragmatic and a social theoretic point of view, at least social theory from the perspective of an economist. So first, let me establish uh, why I say that we're in a crisis of economic governance, because I mean something more than simply being in a very bad downturn. Uh, you could say, well, we had a you know, miserable mismanagement of uh, the financial system under Greenspan. Now we're suffering the, uh, the remnants of a financial bubble, and that's certainly true. But I think it's only really the beginning of uh, what we're finding. So I see several symptoms and uh, several uh, deeper consequences of all of this. Let me start with one that I regard as a, a key symptom as well as a uh, potentially uh, extremely dangerous uh, trigger uh, in the future, and that's the massive budget deficit that we have. We have the largest peacetime budget deficit in our history by far, 10% of our gross domestic product. By itself, that already is a matter of some concern because if our government's borrowing $1.4 trillion uh, per year right now, we ought to be concerned about the implications of that for the future, for debt, for macroeconomic stability, and so forth. And even as my friend Paul Krugman tries to tell us in his column twice a week, don't worry about it so much, I'd say, do you worry about it? Uh, it, it is uh, actually large even for a $14 trillion economy, even for the United States. But it's also a symptom. It's a symptom of a quite dramatic breakdown of consensus about the nature of government, the readiness to pay for it, uh, the ability to shape a shared collective future as reflected in the budget, which is the most important financial expression of collective action that a country has. Second obvious feature of our time, completely stunning, is the degree of at least rhetorical polarization uh, that we have in society. Now other societies in fact are even more deeply polarized and have battles on the streets, but the ugliness and vituperation in this country is quite unusual. 
and the absolute lack of, uh, of, uh, of civility is unprecedented that as far as I can remember for 50 years, maybe uh, we don't have to go back to the Depression, the McCarthy era would be enough uh, to go back to, but it's been a long time uh, since we've had this kind of ideological polarization in the country. Third, of course, uh, both another symptom and a cause of uh, a lot of this is the unprecedented economic inequality, which arguably is the highest in our history, though we can't precisely make comparisons against the 20s or the gilded age of the 1880s and 1890s. But there's no doubt that there's been an explosion of income and wealth inequality in the last 30 years that is at least the greatest that it's been since 1929, and arguably that it's ever been in, uh, in this country. The fourth feature of this crisis of governance is the collapse of the repute of our political institutions. Uh, I guess uh, there was a survey yesterday which I read, and I'm not sure which survey it was. May, I think it may have been Rasmussen which uh, every four months asks about a number of professions and how people rate them. And uh, this most recent survey put US congressperson at the very bottom uh, of uh, every profession mentioned, uh, including bankers, financiers, uh, some other unsavory characters, um, and uh, put a uh, put, uh, member of Congress at the very bottom. Now, Congress is uh, the most representative of our, of our political institutions in uh, at least a civics class theory. Uh, and it is collapsing from the point of view of representation right now. And so this is a very profound crisis. There are other of our institutions that are in somewhat higher repute, but it worries me that the military is probably the highest of our civil institutions, uh, in, uh, or higher of our uh, public institutions, I should say. I'm happy that it's uh, well regarded, but I would like to see our civilian institutions uh, even more regarded, but they are not. And what this collapse of uh, reputation reflects, I think, is several phenomena. One is a strong feeling that a lot of social science, especially opinion survey, evidence and other kind of metrics show, which is that the Congress actually does not systematically reflect the values and the preferences of the public, even necessarily of the public within the districts represented by the individual congressmen and senators. Second, there is, of course, uh, pervasive evidence of paralysis on many fronts, so institutions are not functioning to deliver practical governance and practical solutions. And I think it's stunning to watch before our, our eyes over the last 15 years how passing legislation in the Senate has gone from, 50, uh, gone from simple majority to 60 as the accepted norm, though the filibuster is nowhere in the Constitution and there is absolutely no basis that I can see why the filibuster is the baseline. The filibuster used to be used basically to block civil rights legislation, not all legislation. Now 60 is the defining standard for everything, and of course it's leading to a kind of systematic paralysis that is dramatic uh, and without a constitutional base. And third, the, other, the, the third reason uh, for the collapse of uh, repute is obviously the sense of pervasive corruption in all aspects of our public institutions, and especially in the Congress. Uh, the fact that all parts of the political process are uh, greased with money right now to an extent that has always been part of our history, but never so flagrantly in at least the last half century. I can't vouch for all periods of US uh, public life, but this is a dramatic uh, change that has come upon us over the last quarter century. So that was my fourth uh, 
piece of evidence of crisis of governance. Uh, the fifth uh, dimension of this crisis is that our systems, and by systems I mean our institutions directed at particular pieces of economic or, uh, or uh, security or other dimensions of our collective life, are not functioning. They are simply not performing. Uh, New Orleans, uh, I already said, I think is a, it's the most notorious and obvious case. But that was really a, an utter stunning collapse before our eyes in the ability to do the most basic things of emergency relief, connection of, uh, of communities. We learned how we have privatized, contracted, uh, close down so many areas of government that we can't even do simple things anymore. Uh, obviously, the collapse of our intelligence uh, networks and agencies is the other uh, uh, notorious uh, part of uh, this decade. The complete inability to even think about the developmental aspects of Iraq or governance aspects of Iraq or the same with Afghanistan now, surely uh, a, uh, an unbelievable fact that we're about to put another uh, 30,000 troops in without a single coherent paragraph long uh, realization about the people of that country. Uh, this is a measure of profound failure. We knew it from Vietnam, but we're seeing it again. So uh, perhaps that one is not uh, unique, but it is incredible failure. The banking system and finance, this is a systems failure, obviously. We systematically wrecked a major sector of the economy uh, over the course of about 30 years. Uh, starting in the 1980s, we systematically dismantled everything that we had built in the 1930s as the reaction to the Great Depression. So uh, Glass-Steagall, the uh, efficacy of SEC oversight, the efficacy of FDIC oversight, the role of the comptroller of the currency, and so forth, was systematically dismantled. And it started with the savings and loans. That, within about five years, turned into a completely corrupted uh, morass. We quickly forgot about that to go on to the next bubble uh, and uh, had the, uh, <coughs> the next uh, bubble of the Mexican bailout. Then we had the East Asian financial crisis three years after that. Then we had LTCM uh, the next year after that. Then we had uh, the Enron and uh, WorldCom and all the other uh, scandals uh, at the beginning of this decade. Then we plunged in, we had the dot-com bubble. Then we plunged into the subprime bubble. This is a systematic, uh, repeated failure of governance, not a series of accidents or shocks. And I think more or less it continues to this day. We're on a path to set up the next one is if there's nothing better to do. Uh, we've still not been able to uh, regulate any basic aspects of this broken system. We'll watch next month Goldman Sachs, which is some other part of the Sachs family, I have to assure you, uh, <laughs> pay themselves $20 billion of our money uh, with our political system being unable to say that's wrong. So that's another piece of, uh, of profound breakdown. Our automobile sector, as the cars still drove, they drove right over the cliff. Uh, I've realized that our industries are so effective at lobbying that one after another they lobbied themselves to bankruptcy because they prevent the kind of responses and actions that might stave off disaster. So we have failed systems in almost every part of our economy with increasing frequency. And so these are, again, systemic, not accidental, not conjunctural, uh, not mistakes. This is a breakdown that we're seeing, and it's 
it's weird. And of course, uh, the, the sixth point is that we're back to uh, Richard Hofstadter's brilliant insight that we've returned once again to the paranoid style of uh, American political life. Uh, we have, uh, but maybe it's the Marxist uh, sense of it returns as farce this time. I was about to say Lou Dobbs uh, and, uh, and nativism. We have uh, something that I find unbelievable and it really makes me quake, which is the rabid and relentless anti-science now among major centers of the media, starting with the Wall Street Journal, which is on a campaign not to point out weaknesses or strengths in the climate change debate, but if you read, say, Dan Henninger's column this morning and go back and read what the Wall Street Journal has been writing, and that's uh, an idiotic page, that editorial page, but it's actually the leading newspaper of this country. It's the biggest circulation. It's by far the most influential newspaper, more influential than the New York Times, more influential than any other newspaper. It's not merely ranting and raving about climate change. It is now every day saying that science itself is a global money-driven conspiracy. So the message that is going out to the public is don't believe anything the scientists tell you. So we're becoming unhinged from even the most basic standards of knowledge that one would need to be able to make decisions that would have a rationality and a sense of uh, a potential efficacy. So that's what I mean by crisis of economic governance. And I'm going to muse for you why, but I don't know why. Uh, I do think that it is a matter of urgent social inquiry to try to understand why this has happened, because I would argue this is quite different from even 10 years ago, and it's certainly different from 25 years ago. We can find the roots of it in Ronald Reagan's inaugural address. We can find uh, when he said that governance was the government was the problem, not the solution, and began a campaign against uh, government as a social institution but rather one that needed to be effectively closed down so you could see this as the end result of, of that. But why our society has uh, gone in this direction I regard as a tremendous puzzle. Let me add one more piece to the puzzle. It's not as if capitalism and all aspects of our economic life have failed by any means. This is a period of absolutely remarkable technological advance. And so some parts of our economic life are stunning in the progress, even in the midst of all of this. And of course, the two great areas of this are biomedical sciences and information and communications technology. And I think it's important to note that both of those have been heavily driven by the private sector, though not only by the private sector. And so market institutions are actually doing some amazing things in creating new industries, creating new products of tremendous social value, in my opinion, uh, in showing uh, still the innovative potential. Uh, but it's in a context of a growing governance crisis. Before getting to the, uh, the, the possible reasons, let me just say perhaps the obvious, some of the implications. First, we are in a period of unprecedented economic instability. And if it's not just this latest crash, and it's not going to be over soon. Because we are bouncing with an amplitude which we've not seen for a long time, and I don't think that's going to change for a while. I see no trajectory that is realistic that just gets us back to a smooth growth path uh, at, uh, at the moment. We've gone through serial bubbles and bursts, uh, and we are in a, uh, from a macroeconomist point of view, in a completely anomalous and dangerous situation of zero interest rates, uh, rampant liquidity, emerging new bubbles in uh, commodities markets uh, in East Asia and so forth, 
doing exactly the same thing that we just learned shouldn't have been done between 2002 and 2005 with a budget deficit uh, that I noted was is unprecedented in size. So, <laughs> and a job machine that obviously is broken, which is why the White House had, had the meeting today. Uh, second, we're seeing in the, uh, from the middle to the lower range of the income distribution in this society, a crisis, I believe, the depths of which uh, we don't really feel, but which is tr absolutely dramatic. And uh, you feel it, maybe I feel it, because we look at it, we study these things, but I think our society is so uh, divided that uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what's happening at the bottom of the income distribution. But for unskilled workers, there is mass unemployment. There is, of course, uh, mass jail time. Uh, there is a breakdown of the education systems in major cities in this country, uh, where in Detroit, for example, uh, perhaps fewer than half of entering ninth graders finish uh, high school education at this point. There is a growing collapse of finishing four-year uh, college, especially at state universities. Uh, new data are coming that are showing the uh, failures of completion rates uh, at, uh, at university level, which is something we've not seen. We have one out of five children in this country growing up in poverty now. One in three children in African American and, uh, and Hispanic households. One in nine Americans on food stamps and one in four children being fed by food stamps. This is not a middle-income country. I'm talking about the United States of America. But it's the new normal. And so this is a dramatic uh, breakdown at the bottom at the same time that down the block from here, we have uh, absolutely irresponsible, uh, unjust, un unjustified, and unearned income of gargantuan proportions still continuing. And a third implication is that we have drift and inertia. And I feel, as uh, I suppose many of you do, that uh, the hopes uh, with the President Obama for a breakthrough are not being fulfilled right now. Uh, this is not even necessarily a personal judgment. I like the president enormously. He's just as bright as can be. Uh, he's as committed as can be, as honest, as decent. I witnessed it again today. But things are not working. Uh, and we are not solving basic problems. And even the processes uh, that uh, he's using to try to get this one piece of legislation through right now are uh, so eviscerating uh, the goals of, of this that uh, it's almost not quite unrecognizable coming out the other end, but showing how far we are from where we would like to be. Now, let's uh, do just a few minutes of social theory to try to understand this. And my approach always in social theory, because it's probably my lack of proper theoretical training, uh, is uh, comparative. Uh, so to ask, uh, because I really like observing contrasts as uh, just about the only way I can understand anything. And I guess the first observation I would make is that this is not a global phenomenon. We are in the world seeing highly differentiated political and institutional performance right now. And by no means is it a generalized global crisis. Everybody's feeling some pain and some shocks. But in many places in the world, one doesn't have the sense of uh, things falling apart, uh, except for the fact that everybody is affected by the US being in this uh, state of, uh, of profound difficulty. So my favorite part of the world from an economic point of view uh, are the Nordic social democracies, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland. Uh, and uh, arguably uh, Netherlands, uh, which is kind of a, a half there and a half uh, of a continental, uh, more continental European 
uh, mold. Those countries are performing rather well. They're feeling the hit of a global recession, but levels of education are at all-time highs. Social cohesion remains very strong. Indeed, interestingly, Sweden, as you know, has become a country of uh, immigrants. Uh, and uh, despite having a non-native-born population now that's 13% of the country, roughly the same as the US, the social democratic values are holding strong, and the institutions are continuing to work. Life expectancy is at all-time highs, about four years, I guess, through don't quote me on it, I don't remember the most recent data, but maybe three or four years longer than in the United States. We're at 78, Sweden is probably at 81 or 82. Here's the life expectancy, of course, universal coverage uh, of, uh, uh, of, for healthcare, universal access to education at all levels, low levels of unemployment, a budget that is in balance, a democracy that is very robust, uh, smooth alternation of power, of, of course, uh, a sense of a level of corruption that is extraordinarily low. Once every few years, a minister uses a credit card that he or she shouldn't use. They're out of office in a moment. That's the worst scandal I can remember in Sweden or Norway uh, in, uh, in the last decade. There has been no big scandal, and in every comparative ranking of Transparency International or other corruption perception measurements, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Singapore, and a couple of others rank right at the top. So the Nordic countries do extremely well. Continental Europe, and I'm putting aside, uh, obviously, the Anglo-Saxon uh, variant of the UK, but thinking of Germany or Netherlands, uh, Economic performance is not as good. Uh, the social cohesion is not as large. The budget deficit is a bit more grinding. Uh, unemployment's a bit uh, larger. Innovation is a bit less. But still, I would say the performance is vastly better than in the United States. And so there's a, I won't get into Italy. Uh, Italy is its own. Uh, actually its own tragedy, uh, as, as a matter of fact, but an entertaining one, uh, <laughs> as always, but uh, not, not a, not a well-performing economy or polity right now. But a lot of countries that are, you would not say, are experiencing the uh, angst uh, of, uh, of, of the world the same way that we are. Interestingly, a lot of emerging markets, of course, though facing a range of problems of incredible complexity are also experiencing a tremendous amount of material progress, and I would say political progress as well. And Brazil is probably uh, a country that, for me, comes to mind as having put together <coughs> now nearly 20 years of improving governance with a lot of flaws, uh, good economic performance, technological upgrading, and narrowing of income inequalities, and a feeling of robustness uh, about all of this, uh, represented by Mr. Lula and his, uh, his enthusiasm, and a sense that in the election that will come in 2010 that there will be continuity, again, with the more responsible leadership. We'll see. China, completely different case uh, in terms of uh, politics and society and, and too complex for me to discuss at length, is obviously in many, many crucial ways a remarkable, remarkably success, successful uh, economy. And perhaps uh, one could say the most successful catching up economy in world history over the last 30 years with economic growth that has averaged 10% per year for 30 years, meaning a doubling every seven years, meaning four and a half doublings now, meaning a 20-fold increase of economic activity since Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978. And with all of the flaws and, uh, uh, and uh, social 
uh, divisions and environmental crises in China, uh, which are all real. I think the quality of many aspects of governance is extraordinary at the same time. The professionalism and skill, the management of economic development, the building of basic infrastructure uh, is uh, in, in many ways uh, even unrivaled, one would say, for a country where as late as 1980 about 50 percent of the population was in a dollar a day poverty and now it's down to about 10 percent. This is something uh, that we've not beheld and this is for 1.3 billion people on the planet. And then, of course, there are lots of places in the world that have fallen apart uh, that are, to use the ugly term, failed states uh, or, uh, if not failed, extraordinarily fragile. Uh, and uh, Haiti is uh, obviously uh, one of these that uh, shifts from crisis to crisis and sub-Saharan Africa is filled, filled with them. But the point I'm making is that one can't call this a generalized crisis of governance. Uh, there really is a remarkable variation of what's happening in the world, divergence of economic performance. We're even seeing it in this business cycle because Asia Asia's growing rapidly. Uh, China's back to 9 or 10 percent growth right now. India, 8 percent per year economic growth. And this, when the United States is struggling to avoid a, a second downturn uh, in, uh, in the next few months. So, why? What can we learn about all of this? I think there are three, I'm, I'm going to present uh, in a very uh, unsatisfactory way, uh, three kinds of hypotheses of, about uh, success and failure uh, of economic governance and say a few words about them and then try to understand uh, what went wrong, in, uh, what has gone wrong in this country and, and what might be done about it. So in my profession, with uh, all its uh, flaws of, I would say, uh, um, the kind of economic analysis that, uh, not quite that I grew up in, uh, but that became quite dominant, actually, of course, in the 1980s and so on, of uh, free market economics, the prevailing theory of economic governance was the Hayekian uh, or libertarian view that the key to economic success, of course, was a market economy, but that the key to political success also was a market economy. And we were sold on the idea that the way to preserve democracy is a small state, and that if the state is kept small, we avoid the road to serfdom. Uh, and uh, while Hayek meant that originally in 1945 to warn against overt socialist ownership of industry by the 1960s, he was saying that that applied to the social welfare state. So that was one theory of economic governance that became quite a dominant theory. And the book stalls are filled every month with new books along these lines. It's obviously a pathetic failure as a political theory uh, because what we see in the United States, which remained the small state relative to the social democracies, is the collapse, uh, or if not collapse, the profound deterioration of democratic institutions, actually to a large extent at the hands of business, whereas the large states, uh, I'm sorry, the powerful states, which I would say the social democracies represented, the ones that were supposed to lead to the road to serfdom, produced the absolute highest performance of democratic representation and quality of public institutions. And so not only did social democracy not produce uh, economic serfdom, as, as Hayek uh, found, it actually protected the quality of democratic institutions. So this, I think, is the first puzzle uh, or not puzzled, this is a, a first basic observation. And in our country, in our, of course, in our traditional ideology, which goes back to uh, the founding myths, our fight was against despotism as the defining measure of, uh, of uh, the economic political interaction. But what we have opened ourselves up to by keeping the state so weakened, in fact, 
is actually the takeover of the state by, uh, by special interests uh, that have uh, demeaned and, and suborned it. Now, a second model says that uh, what's happening in the United States should be fairly universal, that yes, the United States is run by Wall Street. I think that's a fair description of how our economic policy has been run uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, the deregulation, the determination of monetary policy, the tax policy in this country uh, really was uh, taken over by a uh, by class, uh, class interests and by sector uh, interests and uh, all aided and abetted by a flow of lobbying, funding and revolving door policies that are not so hard to trace. But that kind of view of the state, which is uh, obviously a traditional uh, Marxist or leftist view, also is highly problematic because it did not occur in many capitalist countries. And again, I'll refer to the social democracies. Those are completely capitalist in their basic productive arrangements. Sweden has almost no more, or basically it's got the same level of public ownership uh, as, uh, as the United States. It's the productive sector is privately owned. But the difference of governance and business relations in Sweden and the United States was brought home to me in a conversation a couple of weeks ago with one of Sweden's leading CEOs of one of the giant Swedish multinational companies. And he complained to me that he couldn't get in to see the prime minister for the last three years, which is stunning because Stockholm's a small place. But the prime minister of Sweden didn't see it fit or appropriate to meet the CEO of one of Sweden's largest companies. And the reason is that the method of representation is completely different. Uh, it is a corporatist representation. You go through your confederation of industry, you can have a formal discussion, but an individual business going in to see a political leader is not appropriate, actually. And so the, it, the idea that uh, biz, big business will simply take over government and that's the way it is, is also not true within the universe of, uh, of capitalist countries. And there is an extraordinarily important lesson in all of that. We are uh, so much more uh, money infused in our politics and interest group infused and particular company infused uh, with Goldman Sachs being at the top of the heap for the last 20 years, uh, that uh, those distinctions, I think, are absolutely crucial. So what is working? Well, you will attack me for being too simple-minded, but I'm going to put forward a simple-minded idea, which I think has some merit when I look at what is it that is driving the relative success of a very wide range of countries whether it is the social democracies or even a Brazil or a China uh, or uh, other uh, of, of the emerging markets. And I would call these, on the whole, consensual societies that are succeeding right now because there is at least a basic underpinning of shared understanding of collective life and the purpose of political institutions. And this is even happening in places as traditionally divided by race, class, ethnicity as Brazil. Uh, it is a feature of China, broadly speaking, though obviously not with the minorities in Western China, but it is a feature that is um, cultivated actively by, uh, by the Communist Party and, and by the Chinese leadership. Now, those consensual values that I see working in a very wide range of more successful countries than ours in governance right now are a sense of universalism, that the purpose of the state is uh, very broad, if not completely universal in its representation, overtly redistributive. So for the first time we have in Brazil since Fernando Enrique Cardozo and then again with Lula, we certainly have it in China 
uh, with its uh, Western China development policies and its anti-poverty programs. Uh, we have it as uh, the central norm of the social democracies, uh, a uh, commitment to redistribution. And I would say a third value is developmental. And by developmental, I mean that the state is seen as having a purpose of problem solving to secure material well-being. So the state is not seen simply as an arbiter uh, of uh, conflicting interests. It's not seen as simply a battleground for rents, but it's actually seen as an instrument of collective problem solving, and I would call that a developmental state. And so the values that I see underpinning success are those three, universalism, redistribut redistributive commitments, and uh, developmental. And those values translate into even quite explicit, sometimes quantitative goals and five-year plans, sometimes a, a little bit uh, less formal, but they do translate into specific goals. And those goals include economic growth, of course, uh, include poverty reduction as a deliberate goal, uh, include uh, norms of uh, social equality and constraints on uh, super wealth, though not always, and increasingly include goals of sustainability. In other words, responsibility towards the environment and towards future generations. And I think that this values and goal-based uh, metaphor or simplification is actually, it's helpful for me because I feel that this is not uh, present in the United States right now, not even in our self-definition, not even in our norms and the, the mythos that we choose to, uh, to, to uh, depict. Maybe universalism is, redistributionism is uh, absolutely uh, not part of uh, any norm right now. Uh, in fact, uh, one cannot admit to being redistributional and hope to win uh, high office in this country uh, at all. And the idea that the state is developmental, in other words, is an active problem solver, is also uh, against the grain. Now, it's not always been this way. Uh, there was a stretch from the 1930s to the 1960s where every one of those premises was absolutely explicitly on the table. And so this country is capable uh, of that. Uh, from the New Deal and, and uh, New Deal through uh, the Great Society, universalism, redistributional, and developmental goals were taken as absolute norms. And that's why, for me, that moment when Ronald Reagan, a president of the United States, takes the oath and says, our government is not the solution. This is an extraordinary moment in our history, actually. Uh, of course, he reflected many forces, he caused much damage, but he marked a watershed that separates us from values-based and goal-based societies of the kind that are successful. And so whether it's the social democracies, the, the basic Confucian underpinnings of even the Chinese Communist Party philosophy, because when the party talks about the harmonious society, they're talking about a Confucianist ideal. Uh, and they're talking about a well-ordered, rightly ordered, harmonious uh, society. Um, this is uh, something that I feel we don't have right now. Uh, there is something also about poor emerging markets that can embrace technology and developmentalism as a very natural organizing principle, because catching up is such an obvious goal and such an obvious unifying theme. So there is something that makes it easier, even in a divided society, to say we are catching up. That's the purpose of the state. That's what we're doing. We're improving our technology, narrowing <coughs> gaps with richer countries, securing uh, national security as a result of this. But the commitment to developmental philosophy is something, again, that we don't have. So what do all of those societies, consensualist societies, have as features that enable them to keep a more, uh, an improved balance compared to what we're seeing in the United States right now, and what would it take? First, 
they do, the, the government, uh, I mean, this is in a way Hayekian, but it's also, uh, it turns out to be salutary. The government prevents the accumulation of huge rents accruing to the private sector. And we have two main sources of easy cash in a modern economy. One is hydrocarbons, and the other is uh, hydrocarbons or diamonds or valuable minerals, uh, and the other is finance. Those are the two uh, magic fountains of modern society. It's not so hard for Goldman Sachs to make a fortune. They operate across the street from the Fed. The Fed gives them free money, and they lend it on. And then they call themselves geniuses. And that's a rent. That's being part of the seniorage system. And that's our money, uh, mistaken by them for their money, uh, and mistaken by our Congress, who is financed by them uh, as, uh, as their money as well. So one thing that all of these societies do is that they don't allow these huge economic rents to get out of control. And Norway, for example, is right to have its North Sea gas and oil owned by the state. Because if a little country had that oil and gas owned by a private company, the private company would run the state rather than the oil facilitating a developmental agenda. So the second thing that they all do, which I mentioned, and it's obvious, where Hayek and Friedman and everybody else and everybody of that ilk went wildly wrong in positive theory is that a market economy has absolutely no tendency to produce a socially stable uh, income distribution. And unless there's active redistributionism, not only is there every possibility of market forces themselves leading to bizarre and unacceptable and destabilizing outcomes, but also the wealth that results from that uh, creating a political crisis as well. And that, of course, is what was allowed to happen here. And public-private complementarity is a third feature. The key is not public ownership of the means of production. The key is that the public sector undertakes certain core functions that the private sector can't or won't undertake. Redistribution is an obvious one. Provision of basic infrastructure is a second. Provision of social services is a third. Provision of science and technology support is a fourth. Provision of regulation is a fifth. Because those are all areas where a market economy is not self-regulating and not self-stabilizing. So public-private complementarity is a third feature of success. So finally, where did we lose this consensus? in this country, because we actually had a lot of consensus from the New Deal through the Second World War, which is a forging experience of consensus in this country, through Truman and Eisenhower, uh, and even through, dare I say, Richard Nixon, uh, aside from his uh, utterly strange personality. Uh, but he still continued a policy with, a, a, all, of course, already a, a lot of unpleasantness added to it, but uh, a policy of uh, developmentalism and even uh, redistribution and uh, environmentalism, because the start of the environmental uh, uh, institutions of our country, uh, modern institutions, uh, were uh, under, under Nixon. So where did we lose that consensus? I, I see basically four areas that I would hypothesize are part of this profound transition that I would say occurred from the 1970s to the Reagan era to the next 30 years, where the basic consensus, the shared values, the goals broke down. First, globalization played its role. Now, this is something that all the economies experience, so it's absolutely not sufficient to point to globalization as the key, because Sweden also globalized, but it didn't fall apart the same way, and it maintained its social democracy. But what did globalization do? It surely strengthened capital relative to labor. Uh, it uh, enabled uh, footloose capital to 
uh, not only change uh, bargaining power quite fundamentally within firms, but it also altered the, the global location of industry, and it also weakened the hold of uh, low-skilled workers in the economy. Now, it did a lot of other good things, but it was a direct factor in a widening income distribution. And interestingly, pre-tax, Sweden's income inequality rose a lot, like the United States, not as much, but there was a widening of income inequality everywhere. It's just that in the social democracies and in Europe more generally, they combated that through very active programs, social democratic redistributive programs, whereas we accentuated it by tax cuts and by the increasing power of wealth in our political system. So I would say globalization was a trigger, but it wasn't a sufficient cause. It only was, it was amplified here and it was counteracted elsewhere. Second, I think it's pretty clear that race and ethnicity played roles in this country of breaking uh, a sense of consensus. During the period from the 30s to the 1960s, actually immigration was quite low. Uh, and uh, race was off the table, more or less, because African Americans got almost none of the benefits of, uh, of uh, the uh, changing social institutions until the 1960s. But after the 1960s, both the civil rights success and the very rapidly rising immigration in this country, and especially the rising Hispanic population, I think definitely contributed to the polarization of society. And one can trace the backlashes, of course. It starts with Nixon's election in 1968. It starts with the tax revolts in California in the 1970s, which is an anti-Hispanic reaction. Uh, it's the loss of uh, a lot of the, well, it's the change of politics in the US South uh, that is racially driven in the 1970s and so forth. So I would say that this is a second feature that uh, the United States experienced. Third, we know it's related, but it's also distinct, is the remarkable sorting that took place in this country sociologically over a 30-year period in a very mobile population where congressional districts, regions, areas uh, within metropolitan areas sorted themselves ethnically, class, religion and ideology. And so there's a lot of good social science showing that uh, congressional districts have become far more homogeneous, much less contested. The middle ground has disappeared. Uh, the uh, underpinnings of polarization through the geographical big sort, uh, as it's been called, uh, is, uh, is part of this. And I think that has contributed to paralysis and a loss of uh, middle ground in this country. And then the fourth is the extraordinary power of economic rent to subvert the economic system. And we've had in our country two major industries that have played that role. One is the oil sector, and it's played that role mainly with the Republican administrations. And the second is finance, and it's played the role mainly with Democratic administrations. Uh, surprisingly enough, because uh, both the Clinton administration and it looks like the Obama administration are basically Wall Street administrations. Uh, that's how they were financed. Uh, that's where a lot of uh, good, otherwise even liberal thinking might come from, except for those 30 billions of bonuses uh, and uh, the deregulation of the financial markets uh, and, and all the rest. And so we let loose two huge gushers in this country. The oil sector, and actually I hadn't really thought about this too systematically until uh, I was thinking about this talk, but the oil sector, of course, it was always influential and it uh, determined a lot of our foreign policy from the 1920s onward and especially from the 1940s onward. But the power of big oil in domestic politics rose tremendously in the 1970s with the oil uh, price hikes. And that played its role. And I had not really realized that, I have to say, until thinking about it a little bit. I've studied the so-called resource curse hypothesis. I wrote one of the 
initial papers that hydrocarbon societies have a harder time in development uh, and have been part of a debate on that for the last 25 years since writing that paper. But the fact is, um, I never put it vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but it actually, that model actually works. Uh, a lot of our Middle East policy, a lot of the wars we've been through, uh, the uh, nature of Texas-based politics, the rise of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the Texas politicians in this country, which I do not believe has been a salutary force uh, in, uh, in, in the last 40 years uh, in uh, our economic governance, uh, is uh, the unleashing of the hydrocarbon sector politically. And the second was the, the destruction of the constraints on finance. And those came already in the mid-1980s. And that, too, let loose this remarkable gusher of money in politics. So it's prob that's my hypothesis. It's probably not just corporate interests writ large everywhere and all the time. But I would say it's a distinctive, uh, very special, disproportionate role played by those two sectors, both in our domestic economic policy and in our foreign policy. Of course, oil in our foreign policy and finance in our, in our domestic policy. So what could be done about this? And uh, uh, if, if that kind of hypothesis is right, that basically we need as a core political uh, resolution of this crisis a return to values and shared goals a more consensual approach, which after all Obama actually was elected to try to do, and I think that's where a lot of uh, enthusiastic support came. But the realities of uh, these financial rents and all the rest are still preventing it from happening. How would one try to restore this? Well, I think uh, some obvious and very pragmatic steps uh, which may be impossible politically because these are path-determined, uh, path-dependent processes, but regaining control of money in the actual uh, literal political processes of campaign finance, uh, the uh, grotesque lobbying, uh, and the nature of political interaction between individual businesses and our Congress needs a fundamental reform. We need a more corporatist model. You do not go in to see your congressman. We'll let the Chamber of Commerce do that. That would actually be OK. But this uh, individual, as you can then debate them, uh, I'm, not rep I'm not advocating what they might say, but I'm saying that the direct role of individual companies controlling individual votes, as they do right now, is out of control. And so we need to reestablish a base of, uh, of, uh, of uh, getting that most immediate uh, and vulgar impact of money out of politics. That means, secondly, control, political and democratic control over finance and energy. Uh, those are the two sectors that have the most potential to do damage to democratic values, those are the two gushers, the two big rents in our society, and we need to focus attention on getting those sectors back under control. And as all of you will remember, that's what FDR said in 1936 when he accepted the nomination for his second term. He said that he was hated by the economic royalists, and that was just fine with him. Uh, we had to get them under control before they enslaved us. And those were words used by a president of the United States, not a rabid, uh, wild radical, but by an observer of the conditions of inequality of the 1920s and 1930s. Third, we do have to work on a shared ideology and values again. And I believe that the potential for such a shared ideology is the flag that I like to fly under uh, which is sustainable development. Uh, if uh, it, it is a commitment to economic equality, to economic improvement, and to environmental sustainability. 
And my view is that these will be the defining challenges in any event, like it or not, in the years ahead. And that there is an ideology and a philosophy uh, and an ethics around this, the kind that Hans uh, Jonas uh, uh, first uh, unveiled in this school uh, when he talked about the new ethics uh, of uh, responsibility to the future that can play that role of reestablishing uh, a shared commitment to goals and values. Well, you've played a big role in, in this place in helping to uh, illuminate the ethics and the values uh, that we need, and I hope that uh, these uh, humble thoughts and uh, open musings uh, will be of some help as we deliberate together. Thank you very much. Okay. I think somebody's supposed to turn us on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fabulous. Wow. <laughs> Technology works. Yeah, absolutely. That's part of the point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here and for such a rich lecture. There was a lot for us to sink our teeth into. Um, Tatiana tells you tells me that I can call you Jeff. Please do, absolutely. <laughs> We're sort of a first name place here at the that's, new school, so that good. works. Um, I have a few questions that people already filled out, but if anybody else has questions, you should kind of raise your card up in the air, your card, if you can. And if not, somebody will bring you a card. Someone will bring you a card, and um, we'll collect them. Um, so actually, the first question I'm going to ask you comes from somebody who had a question about your book, The Culture of Poverty, The, the End of Poverty, mm -hmm. and in which um, the questioner said that in your book, or says, sort of sources your book and says that you talk about the culture factor um, being treated as a roadblock to development rather than a catalyst for growth, which I think does link to some of your comments tonight. And I'm wondering if you can, the questioner asks, if you can elaborate on that. Well, the, the role of culture and development is, a, you know, is an ancient and complicated topic. And I'm actually more on the side that it's a, a limited role, not a huge role, because there are a lot of development theories that put culture at the center. And of course, in a way, Max Weber, uh, in a very particular uh, theory of a very particular historical moment, the birth of rational capitalism uh, in the 16th, in the 17th and uh, in the 17th century, put culture at the core. But others took that to mean many things that only certain cultures could develop, that the difference of wealth and poverty was basically cultural, and so on. On the whole, I'm not very impressed by such views. So if I had to uh, take a, uh, you know, a, a basic stand, I'm more of a, um, uh, Scottish Enlightenment universalist view that everybody can develop. Uh, every culture uh, has the means of uh, achieving development um, and that culture is not a fundamental hindrance. One reason I say that is that culture changes phenomenally uh, and, and pretty rapidly these days also. So the idea that there's some primordial basic uh, irresistible and uh, unchangeable cultural core that would block a society I find to be a very unpersuasive idea. Now, at any particular time uh, in history, cultural practices can certainly play their role as barriers or, or catalysts to development. And some of the ideas I talked about, about and, and two great cultural impediments to development have been uh, the cultural underpinnings of social exclusion and the culture of gender inequality. Those are where I would put culture as playing a very direct role. Ethnically <coughs> or religiously divided societies or caste divided societies and uh, the uh, nearly universal discrimination against women uh, almost everywhere but especially uh, as a as a norm of uh, traditional agrarian societies, which are the starting points for most uh, launches of, uh, of development. And so in that sense, cultural change, empowerment of women, 
uh, or norms of inclusion can be direct instruments of economic development. And I preach those two uh, as a development practitioner, uh, women's empowerment not only as a human right and as a, uh, and, and, and as a good thing, but also uh, as uh, fundamentally important for uh, economic success. And second, of course, inclusion, because it's divided societies, including ours, uh, and the Americas traditionally, which have a very hard time finding that consensus which underpins economic success. Right, right. You talked about um, the sort of race ethnicity question or problem as being one of the things that has contributed to the breakdown of shared values. And then in talking about sort of solutions and things that we needed to do, really the need to work on a shared ideology and values. How do you bring those things together? And you know, you talked about perhaps sustainable development being the place where people could come together. And you know, I'm just thinking about your response just now, talking about women's rights, for example, which is a place where we really were split in terms of race, or where people of color, women of color, were not really included in the women's movement. And I don't know too many of my students these days who even call themselves a feminist, but that's kind of beside the point. <laughs> um, but that you know, that bringing together of the race ethnicity problem and factor with that trying to bring about a sh shared ideology. I'd love yeah, to hear and, and about I that. should, of course, I'm, I hope everybody understands completely that uh, I, I believe in very open borders and, and uh, view immigration as a great strength of this country, but I do view it as a political factor that's quite significant. So I wasn't, didn't want to suggest anything uh, other than it being a reality that has really reshaped uh, our shaped our politics a lot, I think, in the last 25 years. One of the things that's likely to happen, though, if the Census Bureau is right uh, and uh, the uh, share of the Hispanic population in the United States continues to rise, you know, it was about maybe 3 or 4% in 1970. No one knows because no one asked. Uh, and now it's uh, close to 15%. And the expectation is that it can reach by mid-century 25 to 30 uh, percent, and that uh, white non-Hispanic in this country will become 50 percent or less by the 2040s. In my view, that actually, that tipping point in terms of politics could actually change uh, our, uh, just our vote count towards a more redistributional vote in a way that I would like to see. Um, and there's no doubt already that, uh, well, I don't know, that, that's a little strong, but I think it's arguably the case that the Hispanic vote was the determining vote in this past election. Uh, it's possible that it will remain a kind of block vote, voting basically mainly class and mainly from center left mm -hmm. for redistribution, especially for education spending and so forth uh, in future years, and it will become more important in that. And that by itself could define a new majority. So that's one possible answer, uh, right. uh, just as a, as a simple arithmetic answer. I'm not sure about the bigger challenge. Uh, this, is, uh, um, this really has been, of, of course, one of the, uh, the perplexities of all of American history, and it's been the perplexity of all of Latin America, almost all of Latin American history uh, since the founding. Uh, there's no other region of the world that is so fundamentally founded through violence and uh, racial division as, uh, as the Americas. Uh, and nobody has figured this out uh, so, so well. But what I find very exciting is Brazil, as I mentioned. Uh, maybe I'm too optimistic. They always do have a way of, uh, or have had a way of disappointing a little bit compared to expectation. But uh, over the last 25 years, the spread of education and a sense of inclusion has developed that really would not have been imagined in the 1964 military uh, government and right. so on. And so that's the kind of uh, thing that I think should be possible in this country. The kind of coalition that President Obama put together to win the election strikes me as that kind of coalition uh, that, is, uh, that is possible. And that's why these first months have been uh, 
a little alarming right. uh, because uh, we're not actually seeing it yet, uh, the, the kind of hope for coalescing, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose hope yet. Right, right. Well, one, and one might argue that, um, that it can't be so top down, that that was a real grassroots win, but that institutions like the ones in which we're a part of need to be really engaged in making that conversation happen. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here asking you to comment on the productivity of our country. Um, that uh, the questioner says that Bill Mayer likes to keep talking, likes to keep pointing out that we don't make anything anymore, um, and we have this huge finance sector, and then we have industries like the credit card industry contributing negative value. So, uh, um, when government does produce things these days, it's things like Yankee Stadium, where tax-paying economic activity has moved off the tax rolls inside the stadium, and whether you could just comment on that notion of productivity. I like Yankee Stadium. <laughs> uh, but the food's not as good at City <laughs> no, Field. Exactly, though, I know? agree with that. <laughs> um, first, at, at the high end of technology, we're still a remarkably uh, fruitful and productive society and it is technological change which is the fundamental driver of long-term material improvement. Technological change doesn't guarantee improvement because it could also wreck the environment and do other things, but it is the only real source of long-term economic improvement and the U.S. is quite good at it and we still remain quite good at it. The um, as I mentioned, the information communications technology revolution, nanotechnology, biotechnology is in full force. It's stunning. And I find that uh, when I get really unhappy, which is not so hard these days with the state of affairs, spend two hours with Nature or Science magazine uh, and just leaf through the unbelievable sophistication, uh, the unbelievable knowledge, the richness of our scientific capacity of our time, the just pathbreaking things, every single issue. And it reminds us that it's just not true that uh, that, that, uh, we've, we've, that we've lost it as a society or that globally we've lost it. We're in the richest flowering of science ever, and that's why I find it so frightening and thoroughly depressing that you have uh, institutions like the Wall Street Journal on a, an aggressive anti-science delegitim delegitimization right now, which probably the biggest threat we could face. If we lose the scientific foothold in our society, we've lost everything because we will not be able to run a sophisticated economy that has a chance to feed 6.8 billion people in the world and rising without a deep commitment and investment and respect for science and technology. And that's why this know-nothingism that we're treading on right now is, uh, is, is so dangerous. Now, at the same time, we are not educating properly a significant proportion of our young people. And there's no doubt about it. Our schools are not functioning properly, and especially in the lower half of the income distribution. And so how can we hope to be as productive if we're producing a, a society that is that has a lot of functional illiteracy, uh, that, uh, that is uh, not properly trained in, in uh, basic skills, where kids can't afford to stay in school, uh, or for whatever reason of growing up in poverty or, uh, or deprivation during early childhood, which is, can be a marker of a lifetime of uh, difficulty, um, drops out uh, early on. Uh, it's not, it wouldn't be surprising that we'd lose it. And so I think that to address this question, our scientific establishment in this country and its links with industry and universities remain strong. Our education system is in deep crisis and our society is in even bigger crisis because it's not finding the way either to defend the science or the education system. And that's where the threats lie. Right.
Right. You, in your um, answer just now, you, you brought up the, the Wall Street Journal again, as you did in your talk. And one of, the, one of the questioners here has asked a question about the role of media and the monopolizing control of the media. And, the, and, and I would link it, you know, I would add on to the question in terms of thinking about the role of the media in thinking about this larger conversation about shared values and the creation of that kind of a consensual society. And, you know, I think we're all, and I'm uh, really the person to ask is my 14-year-old uh, rather than me, because she, she knows a lot about it, and I have not really turned on the television once in the last year, uh, well, for more than probably a cumulative hour or two, because I can't stand it. Um, not only what you see, but the, the way. Everybody else yes. is watching them. That's yeah, the yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know it is. So that's why I'm not an expert on this by, by any means. Um, what we don't understand, uh, certainly, is the meaning of the media in an age of social networking. I, I don't think anybody really knows where we're heading. Uh, our traditional media are falling down except for the Wall Street Journal. Um, at least they, they, they claim that the circulation keeps going up, which I find doubly depressing because uh, uh, there's, there's no accountability. Um, but clearly, we're also having very different kinds of, of discussions. Uh, and we're, you know, I don't know, my kids, uh, I don't think, they don't read the hard print, but they're reading news uh, all day long, but on blog sites. Um, and what this is going to mean and how we're creating a uh, a full discussion, and they're very up to date every minute. Actually, emailing me uh, links to, did you see this? Did you see that? So it's not, in that case, an, an absence of uh, of the news, but it is the absence of Walter Cronkite as our national discussion base. So we have no shared reference point at this at this moment. And I don't think uh, our sociologists have really given us a full answer about what the implications of this are how fragmented it is, uh, and, and how we're going to coalesce again. But I know when I want to try to say something, it's very hard to figure out how to do it these days. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago, you knew. And if you published in a certain place, you'd have a, the reach of just about everybody that you wanted to, to reach to, have a, to, to engage in, in a kind of discussion. Now it's extremely fragmented, very hard. A very noisy, very short attention span, uh, and uh, hard, hard to know exactly what to do. Right, right. We have an excellent media studies department here, so perhaps Good. we can take that on. All right. <laughs> when they know, let me know. So, um, so there are a few people in the audience who, I'm sure this is a question you've gotten before, but who ask about your comparison to the Scandinavian nations, right? So I'm sure you're ready for this one, but it's, it's good to hear smart people think about this. Um, you know that Sweden has a population of 9 million people, even with the um, rise in foreign-born population that you mentioned. They're highly educated, work in a highly diversified economy. Here we are, 310 million people lagging. You mentioned the school system, for example. Um, how do you kind of come to terms with that comparison, think about a way, is there, is there a nation that looks a little bit more like that us that we could aspire to be, or <laughs> what are the limits of that? Yep. You know, gold standard. Well, the, the the first thing I find it interesting, the gold standard anyway, uh, at least as I would see it, because uh, almost like a you know a, a, an existence proof is worth a lot in mathematics. Just finding an example, and so if you find an example of capitalism that works. Uh, that is socially responsible, environmentally responsible, highly productive, uh, and uh, quite equal. I love it uh, because uh, the textbooks don't discuss big, small. They just say market economy, and some say it's all awful, and some say it's all great. And uh, we know that uh, both of those are highly inadequate. And so having examples, I think, is, can be extremely, <coughs> uh, ex extremely insightful. And I think we can learn a lot from uh, these institutions uh, in terms of how they actually function. Um, you know, there are very specific things about the social welfare state of Scandinavia that are very impressive. The commitment to, uh, to early childhood development, to 
universal daycare from the, from the first moment, uh, basically, uh, which is a, a unique feature even relative to the rest of, uh, rest of Europe. Um, the, uh, an education system which really performs in, uh, in an impressive manner. I think there are a lot of things that we can learn. Now, obviously, the diversity, the scale, the uh, inequality in this country, the ideology and everything else is very, very different. And one, one thing that I wonder about uh, a lot is all of the examples I like indeed are small countries. Uh, 10 million uh, for Sweden and 4 million for Norway and, and so forth. Um, and it, of course, uh, begs the question, therefore, of whether more decentralization of our politics and our uh, social choices wouldn't be a helpful thing, actually. You know, this city, with all its unbelievable complexity, this may be the most complex place on, on the planet in certain ways in terms of diversity, is also, of course, unbelievably successful in that as well. Not perfect, but, uh, you know, and a lot of that comes from the fact that there's a great deal of uh, homegrown governance here. Right. And one wonders whether a more cities-based or metropolitan region-based politics might be part of the solution to this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the liberal tradition that I came from and that uh, a lot of people here, I presume, came from was that the strong federal government is the protector of, of rights. I'm not so completely convinced right now that we really need to do everything through Washington. Um, there are certain advantages, but our country being so diverse and so diverse in belief structure and all the rest, to some extent, I really do feel like saying, okay, you do it your way, we'll do it our way. And letting the sorting actually allow for more natural diversity in a more decentralized fiscal federal system. Right now, our federal take is, uh, I won't get these numbers right exactly, but our federal take is 18% of GNP in taxes and our state and local is 12%. And we transfer, uh, I think, maybe two or three, per, well, maybe about 3% of GNP from the federal to the state and local for Medicaid and other, other state and local programs. But one could think about rebalancing that so that a lot more took place locally. Uh, and maybe it might be that certain places wouldn't be like I would like them, but I wouldn't live there. Uh, and uh, that, that just may be the right, uh, the right way for us to go to be a little bit more like, uh, like uh, the model that I admire. You know, at a, at a higher political aggregation, I'm a huge fan of the European Union with all its uh, perplexity. I actually think it's pretty cool that when they come to naming a president, they name someone completely unknown, uh, even in his own country, uh, and uh, a foreign minister that has no foreign policy experience and all the rest. I kind of like that, you know. Uh, it's a certain modesty of, uh, uh, of imperial ambition at this point in history. Um, and I think that, and one of the interesting things about the European Union is that it is a true shared space and market a true set of values, but the FISC at the center is only about 1% of GNP. So they actually have very little going through the central budget, and it's a highly decentralized system with Sweden at 50% of GNP in tax collection and, uh, and Ireland at the other end and, and so forth. And if our country, since we're about the same size in, in population, GNP, and so forth, if we had that kind of diversity allowed, but still the unified market and, and uh, a, a, shared, uh, a, a shared polity and so forth, maybe, maybe uh, we'd sort ourselves in a way that uh, would ease some of these tensions right now. Right. Anyway, that's just uh, trying to think through that. Right. <laughs> So we have a gazillion good questions, but uh, not enough time. I'm going to ask one more. I'm going to try to uh, combine two of them. One is one that I'm sure a lot of people um, share, and I think you 
maybe raised a little bit of an alarm in, in talking about the way that you envision what's happened or what, the way you perceive what's happened in the Obama administration, kind of the disappointment in the first almost year. Someone here saying it's profoundly disappointment to understand that a president with such obvious intellect and determination to change things should be frustrated by the process. Um, is there a possibility of Obama acting boldly through executive order to change the process as Roosevelt did? And you know, the other piece of this is a little more fun is um, what happens when you go to the White House and how is your opinion taken into account? <laughs> They wave goodbye. <laughs> Probably Sadly. happy to see me go. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a. I'm probably not their happiest face because uh, these days, because you know, I'm I'm a friend of uh, of a lot of the leadership, and but I complain a lot actually. So uh, they keep it's, inviting you back, right. which well, is a good it's, thing. It's right? it's not not uh, but so I don't cheer them up entirely. Um, so what's happened? You know, it's, it's a little bit perplexing. Uh, one thing President Obama said at the beginning was, you know, turning this ship is like turning a super tanker, and, uh, and there's a lot of, lot of truth to that. But I think this, the style of this year is quite different from what we expected, um, because here is a man of uh, incredible eloquence and incredible intelligence, and we expected him to lead. Uh, rather boldly, and <coughs> he adopted a very different strategy. And uh, Rahm Emanuel uh, epitomizes the strategy. I mean, he literally personifies the strategy because that's his role. Uh, and Rahm Emanuel said, I don't, I don't like this quotation. I won't get it exactly right, and I don't agree with it. But he said, you know, when one of us academics complained, he said, look, I'm not trying to pass a bill through uh, the Brookings uh, Board of Directors. I'm trying to pass a bill through the US Congress. And uh, his point was, I'm going to negotiate this. And negotiating's a little bit ugly. And you know, legislation is sausage making, and you don't want to watch it. Uh, and uh, my, my, uh, my, my goal, Rahm would say, is I need 60 votes, and everything else you say is, is beside the point. And I don't agree with that. You know, I, I think that the process really counts deeply. And I don't feel that we're getting the process that we deserve right now. Uh, and uh, I'd rather lose uh, a few of these votes and have a better process than, uh, than we're getting right now. And the kind of process I would like is the president stating clearly what we should do. I really, like all of us, I listened to the health care debate. I'm a kind of expert in this, supposedly. Uh, and I am a professor at the School of Public Health. I couldn't make sense of this from beginning till now. Uh, of course, I read the papers and I find out what's happening. But it's completely unintelligible. Uh, on, uh, on the surface, here, here. And, and that is because the president never said what he wanted. And why? Because the lesson was from 1993, if you say what you wanted, you get eaten alive. And that's what, that was the lesson. I think that's the wrong lesson. Uh, then they said on climate change, exactly the same thing. Uh, Clinton, President Clinton signed uh, Kyoto and then never sent it to the Senate, and I'm not going to let that happen. So we're not going to do anything except we'll start with the back room. We'll let the interests add up their vectors of interest, and we'll try to search for the 60th vote. And that's the actual political strategy. And I think, it's, I think they're getting completely pulled out of shape by this. And it is not the kind of, it's not our political system. Now, on the other hand, to show how degraded we are in our public discourse, for weeks or months, I, I said, of course, many others said, but I, in, in my two cents, I said, the president really needs to announce a carbon reduction target before the Copenhagen conference next week. And the White House said, no, no, we can't get in front of the Senate. 
And I said, look, you don't have to, you're not going to declare a law. You're just going to say that's our administration's plan. That's what the president should do, that it is my administration's intention to reduce by 17% the carbon emissions by 2020 compared to 2005. Well, international pressure finally built, and he announced that three days ago. And there was a sigh of relief internationally <laughs> that there's a number on the table. And then Lou Dobbs said yesterday in an interview with the truly one of the most despicable people in our public life, Senator Ensign, uh, <laughs> who's really a guy, I can't even imagine how the guy can show his face or how he can even remain in the Senate anymore, actually profoundly corrupted, uh, a liar, uh, and a creep. And, and if I'm not being... Tell us how you really feel yes, about it. And, yes, and if I'm not being clear, no. And so, <laughs> and so they're having a conversation, and Lou Dobbs says, and the president says, 17%. Who does he think he is? <laughs> huh? He's president of the United States, Mr. Dobbs. <laughs> That's his job, to help lead. And so that's a little weirdness, actually. But in any event, I, I hope that they come to, come to see this. I'm not sure that they will. Uh, but I, I do think that he's very much held in right now. I think he was overly frightened by his economic advisors, by the way. I think they panicked more than they needed to panic. I've lived through a lot of financial crises. You had to be careful last fall to avoid a collapse, but you didn't have to predict. There was no cause for predicting a depression as long as you did the basic things. But they panicked, I believe, saying that the whole thing is going to collapse because the near-death experience of Goldman Sachs was as close as you come to the end of the world economy. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, it took good measures, and they did those things. But they got a little panicky, and I believe that um, that, that also colored the nature of, uh, of the decision-making early on, in, in my view. Well, here we are. <laughs> the panic phase is over. The uh, paralysis uh, or the frustrations of this process have set in, and I'm hoping that... Um, that uh, the president will use his eloquence and his vision, which I have no doubt about, by the way, uh, and, and his intelligence to, to lead. And I still believe the American people want that kind of leadership and will respond positively to it. Thank you so much Great. for being Thank here. You. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It was terrific. Thank you.